Okay, uh, we're switching to English now. Uh, my name is Ivan, and I'm going to talk about uh, testing on Android and how to set up unit and instrumentation tests for your Android application. So let's start with a unit testing framework called RoboElectric. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it enables you to test, uh, to run a test, uh, Android unit test in your uh, in a locally uh, local JVM on your uh, machine. Uh, the benefit is that you have all Android classes, for example, all the views, activity, activities, etc., available in your test, so you don't have to mod it. Um, okay, so for the setup, there's four simple steps that you have to do, so let's just walk through them. Uh, the first thing you have to do is add some de dependencies in your build Gradle file. Uh, they're listed here. The presentation is going to be uploaded afterwards, so you don't have to remember them right now. Uh, then you would have to write a test application class. Uh, what, is it, what do I mean by that? Uh, so usually if you have an application class extended in, in your application, um, you can write a test prefix, a class that has a name, test your application name, and RoboElectric is automatically gonna run uh, that application class instead of the regular application class that you use. And you can use that to uh, initialize and um, depend, inject your dependencies set up for, for the test. Uh, okay, after you've done that, second step is of course to write your tests. You do that uh, by creating a new class, annotating it with uh, those two annotations from, from RoboElectric, and you uh, add methods that represent tests and annotate them with tests. For more information about these uh, annotations, uh, you can check out the RoboElectric website. We're going to discuss it in a little bit more detail uh, later. Um, okay, here's an example of a really, really short test. Um, as you see, there's uh, those two annotations uh, on the test class. You have to specify uh, the RoboElectric test runner. Uh, you have to give it some uh, constants like um, specify the Android SDK which you will be emulating in your test and uh, points to your build config class. And that's basically it. You set up, you can run your tests, uh, do some asserts, and et cetera. Um, okay, yeah, how, how would you run your tests? You can do it either from Android Studio. Uh, this is an older screenshot. Uh, you know, if you have Android Studio 2.0, you no longer have to specify the test artifact. It's, it's done automatically. Uh, you just click on a test class and run it. Or you could use Gradle. Uh, and run clean and test tests. Okay, so you start writing your tests, and the first thing you're gonna notice is that if you're dependent, in 99% in of the cases you will be uh, on a RESTful API, is that you it's hard to um, test uh, certain parts of application that make uh, REST API calls. So what would you do? You would mock out your uh, networking layer in the application, it has two benefits. The tests are going to run faster because you don't have to wait for the actual attack responses. And they're going to be consistent because you're going to control all the data that's returned to your application and you can reproduce certain test cases, which is very important. Uh, so how would we how do we achieve that with a RoboElectric? We use a library called Mockwest Server from Square. Uh, it's part of the OKHTP library. Um, first thing you have to do is you have to add the dependency. Uh, make sure that the version of the OKHTP and mock web server uh, matches because they're interdependent. <coughs> and, and after that, there's uh, a few small steps you have to do in order to use it. Uh, basically, you instantiate the class, you start that server. It's going to start a local um, web server on your machine, and you can start queuing the responses to it. Basically, you can queue, I don't know, the two responses. And when your application makes a request, they're gonna be returned in the same order in which they were queued. So you can reproduce certain test cases easily. Um, if you're using RoboLet, you can instrumentation test or instrumentation tests. Basically, uh, you have two methods that are run, uh, one before each test and one after each test. One is annotated with at before and the other is uh, at after. And what you do, you um, set up the uh, mobile server in before method and turn it down in after. That way, it's very important to have a uh, new instance of mock web server for each test method. At first you might, want, might, might wonder, um, why would I do that? It's a bit time expensive. 
Uh, but the thing is, if some of your test fails and doesn't uh, pick up all the responses that you've queued, uh, you're going to break the next test if they depend on the same instance of Mongo service. So treat a separate instance for each of your tests. Um, if you're using RoboElectric, uh, you have another method to uh, set up and tear down a mock-up server. Uh, in the test application that I mentioned before, you have two methods uh, before test and after test in which you can um, set up and tear down your mock-up server. It's basically the same, whichever you prefer uh, most. Okay, so in queuing the responses, the mock-up server uh, has a queue method and has a mock response uh, object, which uh, you can use to <coughs> set up various properties like uh, response code, uh, headers, um, how much time you're going to wait for the response, response body, etc., etc., and it's going to return the response by that specification when your application queues for it. Um, one problem is uh, large responses. What would you do in that in that case? Um, if you have a very, very large response body, it's uh, a bit inconvenient to put that in your uh, test class. So here's a little code snippet. Uh, utility method that reads uh, a string from a file in, in the resources directory. So basically you put your tests in test flavor, uh, and in that test flavor, uh, you create a resources directory where you can put uh, files with uh, mock responses and use this method to read them and uh, set them up via mock response object. That way you don't have loaded files with large strings. Okay, uh, once you compute the responses, you uh, run some logic in the test, you're going to have to check uh, the request that, that the application made. So you can get the actual requests that were sent to your uh, server by using uh, these methods. You can get the count, or you can take a request. You can even specify, which is uh, recommended, a timeout, uh, because if, if something is wrong, uh, if your application logic is broken and, you, and the application doesn't make a request when it's supposed to, if you use the first version of take request, your tests are going to hang, <coughs> and your, your, your um, tests are going to probably timeout and fail. This way, it's easier. Uh, you specify uh, 10 seconds, the test fails, and continues to the next one. Okay, uh, a little cold example of a small test method. So basically, first you initialize your uh, mock responses. Uh, you do some logic here, uh, prepare some data, and start activity, which is going to make a request uh, to your mock server. Um, and after the, afterwards, you, you take the <coughs> request, you do some inserts, you check if everything. Okay, so you mocked out your networking layer. You have a local server that you can configure uh, responses to, but there's still one problem. Um, as you know, networking on the Android has to be done in the background thread. But when you're running uh, new tests, it's it's um, really important that everything is run in the same thread because, as I said, you set the test up, you do some uh, logic, and you check out check uh, what's happened, what are the results. And it's really hard to do that if you have multiple threads and you have to synchronize something, etc., etc. So basically, what we want to do here is to flatten everything out on a single thread to tell uh, an interesting layer to execute network requests on the same thread as the application. In test that in tests, that's uh, completely okay uh, and it simplifies uh, everything. So we're going to use something called synchronous executor. Um, in most, in all of our projects, actually, we use retrofit. So uh, you have builders uh, for retrofit uh, that accept executors for the callbacks and for uh, the background thread in which the actual uh, networking request will be executed. And in your application, of course, you're, you're going to want the first executor to have some uh, queue and execute in the background thread. Otherwise, your application will crash for the with command thread exception. But in tests, you're going to use the uh, same executor for both uh, and execute everything on the single thread. Um, but how, how will that executor look like? Well, basically, this is it. You just uh, execute the runnable web test suite on the same thread as, um, as the rest of the application. Simple as that. OK. Uh, I'm going to cover one, uh, one uh, nifty thing that you get with the uh, RoboElectric. Uh, 
I mean, it's inconvenient to, um, you don't have a dependency injection set up in your project, and it's inconvenient to replace uh, an implementation of a class. Uh, you can um, shadow that class. In RoboElectric, what it means is that you tell RoboElectric, um, you give it another class that will replace the implementation of the original class. So you, you'll do some class loader magic and replace the original class with, with your desired implementation. Um, in order to do that, first you have to write your custom uh, RoboElectric Gradle test runner. Uh, it has two important methods. First is the get app manifest method. Uh, that basically just specifies the package name of your manifest and returns the uh, app manifest uh, object. And the second most important uh, method here is create class loader config, uh, in which you specify um, the shadow classes that you have implemented and return them. Mm, this way you, you make your shadow classes available to, to RoboElectric. Uh, the next step, of course, is to actually implement your shadow class. So here's a few an uh, annotations that you have to use. Uh, you, um, okay, it's, it's okay. Uh, you need to annotate the class with that implement and specify the original class that you're replacing and annotate each of the methods with um, an implementation. Uh, you can still use the uh, original class by creating uh, a field uh, annotated uh, with a real object. Uh, you don't instantiate it, the RoboLogic is going to do that for you and you can use that field to call the original a method inside your own uh, replaced method if you need to do so. So to make it a little bit uh, clearer, here's a small, small example. Uh, if you're going to write this, you probably need to use this shadow class because uh, something is broken in RoboElectric regarding uh, the, the outline class uh, in Android, so it crashes. And you have to write a shadow like this uh, and uh, replace the implementation of the set comics that method. So basically, if it's going to replace the outline class uh, set from path method with your implementation. And that's all, all there is to it. Okay. Uh, we'll talk, we've talked enough about uh, the unit tests. I'm going to shortly cover the instrumentation uh, tests and how to set up Espresso for, for them. So basically, instrumentation tests are uh, your UI or integration tests that simulate the user clicking uh, in your app. And basically, uh, they run. They have to run on an Android device or on an emulator. Uh, and in them, uh, usually you don't mock up uh, the networking. You just automate. Or, or you make the process of testing, clicking on the application automated, so you don't have to do it manually yourself. A few steps to set the tests up. Uh, with dependencies, uh, you specify the test runner which you're going to use. You use. Android AJN, AJUnit runner, and you have to write your test classes. In this case, you annotate them with at large test. Uh, you have to have a field annotated with at rule, which will specify which activity you start. You can start um, any activity that you have defined in your manifest. You don't have to start your application. For example, if, if, it, if it usually starts with a flash activity, you can skip that and start from the main screen if you're going to test something um, on the main screen. Um, and running uh, similar to unit tests, you call this a uh, real task, and, or you can run them directly from Android Studio. Uh, again, you don't have to specify their start effect anymore in Android Studio 2.0. <coughs> it's, it's done automatically. Okay. For the end, just a few more uh, quick tips for <coughs> writing your tests, a few usual, useful uh, libraries. Uh, first one is the SRJ Android from Square again. Uh, it, it extends the SRJ library from uh, the SRJ library and sets up, uh, gives you some uh, methods that are useful for asserting the I don't know, states of views and, every, and everything related to, to uh, Android. For example, this you can easily assert if, if your view is visible, it has a text set up to it for something else. Um, test reports will be generated from this folder of your tests. Uh, another nifty thing, if you're using uh, RoboElectric, and if you 
uh, by default, when using RoboElectric, you won't have um, your uh, logcat output uh, outputted anywhere. So in order to have it outputted in the test reports, you have to use this line in uh, your before method. And that way, you can see everything that your application outputted to the logs in your test reports. Um, and yeah, again, um, usually you, you wouldn't use multi server in, in the instrumentation test, but you can do so. Um, it's similar to the new test. You have to set it up in the for method, there is now in the after method. And the, the only difference here is that with the Spresso and instrumentation test, you don't have no, you have no test locations, so you have to <coughs> inject your uh, test dependencies manually in uh, the for method. Yeah, so that kind of sums it up. Uh, here are some resources where you can find more information about what I was talking about. Uh, it's going to be online so you can check it out later. And yeah, that's, that's it for me now. Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have three different feedback. And the first person who had a question on each of these presentations will get a different Why is RoboElectric and not Mojito? Uh, well, <coughs> they, huh, they don't use, they don't provide the same thing. Uh, you can use Mojito to uh, to easily mock out, create a mock implementations of, of some of your classes. I must admit I haven't used Mojito uh, a lot, uh, but RoboElectric is a totally different thing. It provides you a way to run uh, your tests uh, without mocking out the, the Android classes. You could do that with Mokito, I guess, but it would be a lot of work, you know, to mock out all the views that you're using, all the activities. With RoboElectric, you just uh, mock out the networking layer and make sure everything is executed on the same thread and you're ready to go. You don't have to um, mock out anything else. So I would say they're, they're different use cases. You can use them combined <coughs> together. You, you can, for example, use Mokito to mock out something uh, that you're using in your electric as well. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you said you don't use more web server in instrumentation test. Yeah. Uh, what do you use then? Do you uh, well, usually you, you, you run them as they are. Again, I, I must admit, I don't use instrumentation tests a lot. Uh, the reason is uh, on continuous integration servers, uh, they don't they don't run, run pretty good because uh, on Circle CI, which we use, uh, the Android emulator isn't fully supported, uh, and the instrumentation tests crash regularly. So sometimes they pass, sometimes they don't, and we usually just write a ton of um, unit tests and maybe you know a few um, instrumentation tests that we run locally. But yeah, yeah. Is there some benefit from large standardization? Uh, well, no. As, as I understand it, you have to annotate your uh, instrumentation test with it. So, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think you just have to write. Any more questions? Okay. Okay, so let's start. Um, my name is Eiko. I'm an engine developer here at Finum. Uh, I'm working on a remote office in Slovenia. Um, and today I'm here <coughs> to share my story with you. Um, to be more precise, my quest for WebSockets. So, Every story has a beginning, and so does mine. In most cases, those stories are tragic, but mine was a little bit more okay. So, a few months ago, uh, I started working on one of our projects, and uh, I, got, I got a simple uh, task, and the task was that I need to create a screen inside uh, any application, which should connect to WebSocket when screen is presented to the user. 
it should fetch the data from web, web socket, uh, render it on the screen. Uh, web socket refreshes the data every five seconds or ten seconds or something like that. So you have to update the UI, and when the user leaves uh, that screen, it should disconnect from web socket in order to preserve battery and uh, your network usage. And we thought, yeah, WebSocket, that's like a piece of cake. It's a technology which is well known, it's been up, it's been on for ages now, and yeah, this should work okay. And I started to, uh, because I didn't have any prior uh, knowledge about WebSockets and their usage on Android, uh, I started uh, some internal research. I quickly found out that we have a large number of libraries which offers um, WebSocket client implementations for Android, like Java WebSocket. Uh, this is a library which is, ah, let's say, it, a port of official Java uh, implementation on from Java EE8, and that should work okay, but it's not working okay. Then we have implementation from OKHTP because in every of your project we need to use at least one library from Square or Jade Wharton. Uh, but at that time, uh, that library was still in some heavy beta. Uh, OKHTP was at that point uh, transforming from version 2 to version 3. They said that uh, versions will not be 100% backward compatible, yada yada yada, so yeah. And you have Autobahn, and I was quite satisfied with it, and uh, I decided to use it, and I wanted to use um, the callbacks from Autobahn in my uh, application, so I intended to have tightly coupled structure, because I thought that Autobahn is the solution to all of my problems, but it wasn't. So at this point, I would like to officially say thanks to this great man, my team leader, my uh, uh, everything. Uh, so let's give a big round of applause to him. Bravo! Uh, he's currently not here because he's doing uh, drugs. Um, and he said to me, let's define custom interface for communication between WebSocket and our application. So he said, Let's not use tightly coupled uh, architecture because, well, maybe it could, it could lead to some uh, problems, which it did. So basically, uh, he suggested an architecture uh, with which we could uh, have decoupled uh, pattern. And that quickly uh, turned out to be a great solution because all those libraries, which I said before, have a gazillion of bots, they are quite unstable and all of them have missing features uh, and some of the features are actually broken and the developers from this, uh, of these libraries are actually aware that they are fundamentally broken and, and they just don't give a crap about it. Uh, so what I mean about with when I'm saying decoupled architecture. So we defined a simple WebSocket service which has uh, some common methods for uh, communicating with WebSocket, like connect to, to WebSocket, disconnect from WebSocket, check the WebSocket is connected, uh, some message callback, like we want to be notified with that callback when the message is received from WebSocket and so on. Uh, then you implement this WebSocket service uh, interface with some custom implementation, so either by using um, OKHTP, uh, Autobahn, uh, Java WebSocket, and then you provide this implementation in Dagger 2 inside uh, application component so that um, you can use that implementation in your application whenever you want. So basically we have something like this, so it, we define a simple uh, service uh, with some common methods like connect, set messages listener, uh, disconnect, reset connection, callback, disconnect, send message, and Connected callback and messages callback are our own interfaces which we, uh, with, with which we want to be notified when something, uh, some action has performed on our website. Um, the implementation is provided with uh, Dagger 2 model. 
So basically, we just provided its implementation with Android async WebSocket service. You will see at what point what this means. And then you just uh, include this model in your application component. And afterwards, whenever you uh, define a private, whenever you define a variable and say that it injects WebSocket service, you will get that implementation. And as I said before, we decided to use Autobahn library. Uh, why? Well, at that point, uh, it seemed like a great solution because it offers uh, WebSocket uh, imp client implementations for different platforms. So basically, you can use Autobahn in Python applications. I even think that it has Ruby implementation, Java implementation, like right? is one of them. I think that it, it's even available for iOS. Uh, it's quite popular on GitHub. It has a really, really simple configuration. So you just connect to WebSocket, define a callback interface for when you receive a message and everything is working okay. And uh, what's, what's may, what maybe was the most important thing, it had only 32 issues. And I was working with, it, I was quite satisfied up to three weeks before production. Because at that <coughs> point, I decided to test if Autobahn WebSocket will work in production. And as it turns out, it wasn't. So, uh, you ask why? Well, there is a thing called WebSocket Secure. So, we have WebSockets, which are some kind of, a, let's say that it's like HTTP, and we have WebSocket Secure, which is, let's say, HTTPS. So we have VS and VSS. And my uh, production endpoint used VSS because it's more secure, and my debug endpoint used VS because they don't care about um, security. And it turned out that Autobahn doesn't have support for VSS. Uh, and at that uh, point, I actually thought that I'm screwed, uh, because as I said before, this was actually three weeks before production. Um, and um, what's even more funnier is that when I debugged the problem, I just saw um, a simple uh, information in stack trace where the author library just says, just said, um, Autobahn doesn't support VSS, and that's it. When you check their uh, issues uh, on, GitHub, on GitHub, you can actually see that that bug was reported like two or three years ago, and nobody fixed it up until now. One guy actually lost his mind, he went crazy, and he completely rewrote the Autobahn library in order to have um, support for VSS. But that's something that wasn't stable, and I really didn't want to, to, to use it. And I just said to myself, okay, I'm using decoupled architecture. I just have to find some WebSocket solution, which will work with VSS, and it needs to have a really easy configuration because I, I had a really, really limited uh, time frame to uh, search and integrate with some other solution. And that's when Android Async came to the rescue. Uh, that's actually a library from the same developer who developed Iron. Does somebody, does somebody use uses Iron? Yeah. Okay. So basically, it's a library which is somewhere between Picasso, Glide, and that thing, something like that. So Android Async is basically a library which uh, functions as a low-level network protocol. Uh, it has support for sockets, HTTP clients, HTTP servers, web sockets, socket IO and so on. Uh, it has a really, really easy configuration, and uh, it's quite popular. It has more than 3,000 uh, stars on GitHub. Uh, and now let's take a little bit, let's take a look at its um, configuration. So this is a uh, uh, code snippet from that uh, Android Ace in WebSocket implementation. So basically I implement connect uh, method from WebSocket service. So at first I check if I am already connected to WebSocket. 
If I am, then I just uh, notify myself that I'm already connected, and that's it. I'll talk, uh, I'll explain uh, this uh, in a little bit more details later. And if I'm not connected, then just connect to that socket at that endpoint using this protocol. So this has to be VS or VSS. And I'm notified by callback when the action is completed. If an exception is thrown, that something went wrong, and I need to notify myself that something is not working okay. Um, if no exception is thrown, then I define a swing callback because I expect that all the data which will be transmitted uh, to a WebSocket will be a simple swings. I define a close callback because I want to be notified when WebSocket is closed. And uh, in the end, I want to notice, notify myself or my application that I'm actually connected to WebSocket. Uh, those two are methods uh, for disconnecting from socket and basically a method which, with which I will be um, notified when the web socket is closed. So at first I just call uh, close on a web socket and this method is actually uh, called if a server uh, closes the connection to, to web socket. So that's actually something I want to be notified and I just call on this method callback. And the last two things are, uh, so basically I need to get some data or send some data from, uh, from WebSocket. So the first method is actually called when some data is obtained from WebSocket. So I just call a uh, message callback and say, okay, I received some message. And if I want to send some message to, to the WebSocket, at first I need to check if it's open. If it isn't, just send the message. If it's not open, then just notify myself that socket is closed and need to handle it properly in my presenter. So, Android async is it's really good, it's really nice, it's a really great library, but I had some problems. So, the first thing was that it's really big and huge library. It has it's bigger than 50, uh, 500 uh, kilobytes. It has more than 3,000 methods which is something that you should be aware of if you're using it on some projects with where you are really uh, tied with your method count. Um, all callbacks are called in background thread, which is something that was quite unusual for me. So, as you can see in uh, all those code snippets, every time when uh, I want to notify myself with some callback, this is actually uh, run in a new runnable, uh, which are executed in callback executor, and if you, uh, if you check the implementation of this, just runs that one on main thread. So that all callbacks in my presenters are on main thread and I don't have to worry. I will like fresh my application if I want to update uh, the UI. And the last thing was, well, that's a problem and a feature. Um, Android, Android Async uh, provides you with an option that you can have multiple parallel connections to the same main. So this means that you can actually connect gazillion times to some uh, WebSocket endpoint and you just send data, receive data. But in most cases, that's something that you want to avoid. So that's why I'm just checking uh, here if I'm already connected to some endpoint. I presume that I was always connected to the same endpoint and I just call on all already connected if that's the case, so that I don't have two parallel uh, connections. That's something that you should be very, very, uh, you should be careful with it, um, because you will have a lot of problems if you expect that you have just one connection and you have multiple connections. Um, more, more complicated example would be that you store um, a list of your open uh, sockets with their endpoints, and then you check do you have some duplicates and then stuff. Uh, so, as you can see from my presentation, um, actually all that process was a huge trial and error uh, uh, flow. Uh, at first we thought that we would need maybe three to five days to implement WebSockets and to, to have everything uh, working okay. Uh, but actually, we spent more than a month and a half just uh, uh, just configuring the WebSocket, web resolving all of the bugs, 
and uh, resolving all the connection issues. Um, as you can, I already saw, so at first I made the mistake because I wanted to use title coupled structure, which was absolutely catastrophic for me because uh, in, in the end I changed three WebSocket implementations. Then uh, we had to migrate from uh, Autobahn to Angel Tasing because it, it didn't use, we didn't have BSS support. Uh, we had a lot of problems with that parallel connection, so basically. I did something, it crashed, it was not working okay, then I fixed it and I was in this vicious circle because uh, as it turns out, WebSockets are really not so simple task today on Android uh, because we have a large number of buggy libraries. Uh, Autobahn was, I think that current release is 0 0.5 from 0.1 or something like that and it was released more than two years ago. Last commit was more than one year ago. Uh, and so, so is the thing with other libraries. I actually thought that OKHTP would help me a lot, but it didn't. Um, if you Google for, if you Google like how to implement WebSocket in Android, you will get a gazillion of outdated uh, forums, uh, blog posts, uh, Facebook posts, Twitter tweets, um, Stack Overflow threads. And in the end, if you want to check if everything is working okay on your Android phone, you're, you need to have some socket client or server, a WebSocket client or WebSocket server application on your phone. And there are a large number of them in Google Play, but all of them are absolutely horrible. They have so ugly UI, it's, it, I really cry when I use them. Uh, and they, have, they all have limited set of features, so you can just, connect to one uh, endpoint, uh, send data to it, receive data from it, but you, you don't have the option like to stream data, to, I don't know, uh, work with malformed data, to maybe insert some random disconnect events or stuff like that. So that's why uh, we decided to open source our implementation of uh, WebSocket uh, integration. Uh, from that application, so we call it uh, the Socket Man. Um, it's a socket client library uh, which showcases WebSocket Im implementation features. It's publicly available on our GitHub. Uh, currently, it's in heavy, heavy, really heavy beta, uh, and it only offers uh, Android async uh, implementation. But in the future, we will also uh, implement the same set of features with multiple uh, WebSocket libraries so that we can have um, client application where you can actually perform some testing, some benchmarks or you, you want to be notified about which uh, WebSocket <coughs> library is best for your use case, is it fast, is it not and also at some point we want to make um, WebSocket server implementation so, if you are interested in it, uh, please uh, download the repository, uh, check it out, uh, start it, use it, test it, open a pull request, and let's get involved uh, in that together. And that's everything what I wanted to say today. So, if you have some questions, uh, now would be a great time. Have you ever tried to use Google Cloud Messaging instead of WebSockets and uh, were there any uh, problems? So, like push notifications or something like that? Well, actually we use push notifications most of our application, but it was a client request that we need to use WebSocket because we had to integrate to uh, to solution which already exists on the web. So, it's it's not the same thing, cloud messaging and WebSocket. The technologies are different and the implementations are different. Uh, but in some cases, actually, it can be used. But I can say right now that you will have a large, you will have one big problem if you want to use uh, push notifications inside of WebSockets. Because push notifications have a limit how much data you can send to one notification, WebSocket doesn't. So basically if you want to 
sent a huge JSON to uh, GCM, you can have problems with that. On WebSocket, it will work okay. I think so. Um, why didn't you just uh, use standard Java, Java sockets? Is it a problem or...? Uh, well, at first, uh, at the same time I was working on some other projects where I was using default Java socket implementation from Android SDK, and um, it, it actually drove me crazy because uh, the configuration is not so simple. We have to do everything by ourselves, and in that application that was actually great because uh, I could configure the socket however I wanted, but actually in this application where I use WebSocket, uh, the first thing is that uh, they already used WebSocket, so we had to use that. And the second thing was that this is just a small part of the application. So we didn't actually have time and no need to, to, to use something that would give us um, huge possibilities for configuration. We just wanted to use something so we can, we would just wanted to connect to it, get me the data, and I really don't care how this is done. We need to speed up the procedure. Yeah, and, and in the end, yeah, you can see the results. <laughs> Uh, some other questions. Yes? Uh, why didn't you use, since you already exploited so many libraries for uh, web sockets, why didn't you use uh, more specific web socket implementations? For instance, if you used socket IO on yeah. your server, there is a dedicated socket IO plugin for Android. Yeah, the problem is that um, we actually had to connect to an already existing web socket. We are, so that's something that is already working in production. Uh, they are using that web socket on terminals, on web applications, and we just couldn't uh, go to them and say, for Android case, we need you to migrate to Socket.io. So we, we, we had that one endpoint, and we, we really had to use it. If it was up to me, uh, at first, maybe I wouldn't use web sockets at all. Uh, and the second thing is that I would probably try socket IO because it has some um, developers are more happy with it. It's, it's, it's something that in my mind looks like a better project than a like better <coughs> technology than uh, just native web socket. Okay. So I'm not using Docker Docker socket IO. I didn't hear the question. Uh, don't use Android Docker. Socket IO implementation. Okay. It's deprecated and very, very bad. Yeah, so, yeah. As I said before, all the, the, those libraries are, are crappy. They have a lot, large number of bugs. Even Android Async, it's, it's not such a well polished problem. Some other questions? Okay. <laughs>
make a pull request as your feature, then do that. Why? Because if you build anything, uh, anything you build needs to be maintained. And if you're not ready for that, then don't do it. Otherwise, people like Jellico might use your library and then complain about it when it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next thing is pick a good name and preferably something that doesn't already exist, something that's fun like HT party that's a Ruby gem for a basically HTTP client. And it, it even has a tagline that makes HTTP fun again. So that's, if you can do that, that's great. It helps with uh, marketing. And the most interesting part is, of course, how to go about building an Android library. And the most important part is the API, because that's the way, that's what your users see. You need to make it easy to use, make it robust, and basically make it as difficult as, as possible to shoot yourself in the foot with it. So uh, I'm going to show you some examples. How many of you have used HTTP URL connection in Android? Great, and you're still trying at night, right? Good. Uh, this is an example of a post request. How do we know it's a post? Does anyone know? <laughs> yeah, but how do we know this is a post and not a get? Anyone? Is it a post? We don't know. How do we know? Set do output true. It's a great API. If you have read the documentation, then you know that post can be used if you call set you up through. But all the other methods, you can use them with set request methods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's actually, if you Google HTTP URL connection post, the second link is a Stack Overflow question where someone is asking, why doesn't post work if I set set request methods post? It's just send the get request. So that's not a good API. Remember that. And uh, OKHTTP, I, I like the library a lot. It's from Square, it has a much nicer API. This is post request. How do we know? It says so, of course. And it's, it's the same thing, except this is not complete. These two methods are missing. You have to do stuff with streams and so on. And basically, th this is a much nicer API. And Try to do stuff like this when you're building libraries. Try to make nice builders because then you have an opportunity to fail on the build method if the configuration is uh, wrong. Basically, uh, basically, if you're doing a post request, you need a body, and in OKHTTP, the post method uh, gets a body, so you can not supply a body. Maybe if you put in null, but then it will fail. And in Oh, in HTTP URL connection, it just plays dumb and makes a get request instead. And the other thing is, you need to fail fast uh, because it's much nicer for a user if his app fails compiling than if it just crashes at runtime for another user. So it's, it might even save them money. Uh, what else? <coughs> This is an example from OKHTP. This is from the builder for request. Basically, they do everything they can to validate. So there are certain methods that permit request body, some, some, some of them require request body, and they just check that for you so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, so basically, validate as much as you reasonably can and as soon as possible. The other thing is, don't expose the internals of your library if you don't have to. Use package protected classes, private or protected methods. Uh, basically, when, when you're using a library and you try to autocomplete something, usually we're lazy, developers are lazy, and we'll, we'll, we won't read the documentation. We'll just autocomplete, and we'll use the first thing that comes, to, comes under the cursor that looks like it might work. So basically, if you have a bunch of classes which are internal, internal only, not meant to be used by by your users, don't make them public because they will use them and then they'll, they will open issues on your GitHub and then, well, you'll have to deal with them. 
and connected to that is also write the docs. Uh, what is it for? Who should use it? And if it's more complicated, more complex, maybe you should also add an example app. Also, the docs have to be easy to find. You should probably put them on GitHub and the README or something like that. If it's more text, then in the README goes the link and the text somewhere else, maybe in the wiki. Uh, but that, that's all of the most important parts. I forgot to mention here that if you're using, if you're making an Android library which has resources, then you should use uh, something called a resource prefix. Uh, it's it's a great little option which lets you specify a press prefix, and then all your resources have to be prefixed, otherwise lint fails, which means it's harder for your user to accidentally overwrite some of your resources. That's it for me. I'd love to hear some questions. Okay, uh, then I have a question. How many of you have already built your own library? Great, nice number. Cool. How many of you are planning to? Oh, Jessica is planning. Great. Cool. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>